Good morning. Uh, I'm Gretchen Crosby Sims, the Executive Director here at the Institute of Politics. We are pleased to welcome Attorneys General Josh Shapiro and Lisa Madigan, as well as our moderator, Marianne Ahern, for a conversation about their office's investigations into allegations of abuse in the Catholic Church. A special thank you to Lisa, who is a resident IOP Pritzker Fellow with us this quarter. We would also like to thank the Martin Marty Center for Public Understanding of Religion at the Divinity School here for partnering with us on this event. I want to mention a few upcoming events. Next Monday, we will see Lisa Madigan again for a panel discussion about the transition of Illinois state government, uh, the new governor's agenda, and what kind of reception it may face in the General Assembly. On Wednesday, February 13th, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, a current um, mayor in South Bend, Indiana, and current Democratic candidate for president will be with us to talk about his new book and why he's running. You can find out more about these and other events at our uh, website at politics.uchicago.edu. We will have some audience questions after our moderated conversations. Please raise your hand. Um, the moderator will call on you, and we will have a, a handheld mic passed around. As usual, we will give priority for the first three questions to students, and we remind you that a question ends in a question mark. Um, we understand that today's discussion covers an incredibly sensitive subject. If at any time the conversation makes you uncomfortable, um, there's content that's especially difficult and you need to speak with someone, we will have university staff members who are available to meet with you in the hall. Here to formally introduce our speakers is Hugo Berrion. Hugo is a second year from West Hartford, Connecticut, studying public policy. He has served as a fellows ambassador here at the Institute of Politics, including this quarter as the team lead for Lisa Madigan. Please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's, to today's event with Attorneys General Lisa Madigan and Josh Shapiro. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our two panelists have actually some striking similarities in their lives. Both attended Georgetown for their undergraduate degrees, both were elected to the position of Attorney General, and both have investigated important issues such as the one we're discussing today, <clears throat> abuse in the Catholic Church. Lisa Magan is currently a Pritzker Fellow, as you heard, at the U Chicago Institute of Politics, which quite literally directly succeeded her position as Attorney General. In fact, not 24 hours after her last day as Attorney General, she gave her first seminar at the IOP. Ms. Madigan is the longest serving attorney general in Illinois history and is the longest serving female attorney general in US history, having served in the position for 16 years. Her office has undertaken enormous amounts of social justice cases as well as legal action against the 690 clergy accused of sexual abuse in Illinois. We also have here the attorney general for the state of Pennsylvania, Mr. Josh Shapiro. Josh Shapiro is a former member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives and was elected to the position of AAG in 2016. Although his investigation into Pennsylvania clergy brought him national recognition, he has certainly been doing great work since the beginning of his term. Mr. Shapiro, along with other attorneys general, has fought President Trump's travel ban. He has sued to stop Pennsylvanians from printing 3D guns and got an injunction to stop President Trump's birth control rollback. Today's conversation will be moderated by Marianne Ahern, political reporter for NBC Chicago. In addition to her extensive political journalism, she has also gained recognition for her religion coverage. In fact, in 1991, she was the first reporter to disclose the sex abuse scandal that led to the archdiocese opening its files and creating a new lay review board. This morning's conversation is sure to be exceptional. Please welcome our guests. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. I, when I received the uh, invitation to be here today, I said, are you kidding? I'm honored. This has been, you know, such a long 28 years of covering this story, thinking that maybe, maybe we were done with it, but we're not. And so to see the work that both of you have done and it made it such uh, an important topic for so many to consider is, is really uh, amazing for me. So, General Shapiro, why don't we start with you? Why? Why was this a priority for you? Why did you make this such a uh, topic that you had to investigate? And how did you carry out this investigation? Sure. Well, first off, let me just thank the Institute for having me back. It is really an honor to be here, and it's a special honor to be here with my, my former colleague but current friend, Lisa Madigan. Um, she was an extraordinary leader here in Illinois, and um, I try and emulate a lot of the work we do, particularly around 
consumer protection on the work that Lisa did in her office. So it's great to be with you. And, and I have followed the great work you've done on the Catholic Church for, and, and the abuse crisis within the Catholic Church for so long. So it's an honor to be questioned by you. Look, here's the deal. When, when I ran for attorney general in 2016, I made protecting children, uh, listening to victims, a top priority. Uh, I had no idea that this investigation was actually underway when I was running. Um, it was in the grand jury. It was in its very, very, very early stages. Um, we had a couple people working on it. And so my first week in office in January of 2017, I was briefed on our grand jury investigations. We have pretty significant criminal jurisdiction within the Pennsylvania Attorney General's office. Not so with every AG's office, but we did there. And I was presented with a choice. You know, do you want to dig further into this, put more resources into it, or do you maybe want to focus on other priorities? And I thought, not only did I want to continue the investigation, I wanted to put the full force of our office behind it and unearth what needed to be known within Pennsylvania. And so we went from having two people working on this case to, at its height, having 150 members of our office working on this. These are investigators. These are lawyers. Uh, these are staff. These are people who scanned each of the half million pages of secret archives that were taken from the various dioceses in Pennsylvania so that we could understand what was contained within their documents. For me, at the end of the day, there was no turning my back on these survivors, and there was no way I was going to let this cover-up continue within Pennsylvania. As the conversation goes on, I'm sure we'll get into more detail, but that's really how it occurred. This was an investigation that had just begun prior to my watch, uh, and it was one that I felt was critically important to continuing, and I'm glad that we did. Yes, and because of that, Attorney uh, General Madigan, here in Chicago, Cardinal Supich has said many times that he has reported all of the cases to the authorities, but your preliminary report before you left office suggested otherwise. What did you uncover? Well, let me also join Josh in saying thank you to the Institute, not just for being here today with all of us, but for having me at all. So it has been a wonderful place to come and uh, try to share some of what I learned over my 20 years in elected office with these incredibly engaged uh, students who really want to be part of the next generation of political leaders. So thank you for having me. Um, and Josh, as we all know, He's a superstar at this point because he didn't turn his back on a very, very difficult, challenging issue. Uh, and so I really want to applaud you for diving in day one and making sure that survivors of sexual abuse had a real voice and, uh, and were not ignored by you or your office, as unfortunately they have been too often over the years. So in the aftermath of the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report coming out, um, I actually printed up a copy and read it. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if anyone has done that. I don't know if most people have the stomach to. It is uh, incredibly difficult to read. Uh, what children endured in Pennsylvania and across our country and truthfully across the world at the hands of Catholic clergy um, is almost unspeakable. And so after reading the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report, I gathered a group of people in my office and said, look, if that was happening in Pennsylvania, it's happening here in the state of Illinois, and we need to be responsive. Mm -hmm. uh, Pennsylvania and Illinois both have six Catholic dioceses, and so the numbers are somewhat similar. We reached out to Josh's office and asked the question, look, you know, what were the resources? What was your criminal authority? Uh, and so we got briefed fully on that. And then I decided to pick up the phone and call every one of the Catholic bishops uh, here in the state of Illinois, as well as Cardinal Supich, and say, we're going to launch an investigation. And we'd like your cooperation in that. Uh, they initially, of course, said that they would be cooperative, uh, just as you quoted, uh, that all the information had been fully reported. Um, as you know, back in December, we put out an initial preliminary report because I think at the time that we started our investigation in the Attorney General's office here in Illinois, there had been approximately 140 uh, priests that the clergy had actually put out as having either credible allegations or substantiated allegations. They used different terminology and different standards um, against them in terms of had actually abused children sexually. 
But what we found from going through the information from these six dioceses across Illinois is that, in fact, uh, there were hundreds and hundreds more priests who had allegations against them. In fact, the number was nearly 500 more than had been disclosed to the public, so for a total of 690. As part of that investigation that we were you know, in the midst of and still are, I mean, at the point that we put out um, the preliminary report, ex exactly what it was, still ongoing investigation, the diocese decided all of them at the time, only Chicago and Joliet had put out a public list but the other four decided they would put out public lists as well. In addition, there were another 45 uh, members of the clergy that they decided to put out publicly. So there's an enormous amount of work that remains, but what I would say that we learned initially is that this abuse problem is much greater than has been publicly disclosed in the past. Without a doubt. That the Catholic clergy has done and the leadership has done everything possible to avoid making this information public and avoid doing thorough investigations uh, in these circumstances, and that they've really failed survivors. Uh, they have not put survivors first, which is part of their charter and part of what they are supposed to do and part of what they claim they're doing. Uh, so I would say those are the three biggest takeaways from the investigation that we opened in terms of the preliminary nature of it. Often in covering this story, we hear the words um, inappropriate sexual misconduct. But both of you in your reports used the words rape. And words matter. Uh, is this proof that the Catholic Church was given preferential treatment? How, how uh, why, why is that? Why is the language inappropriate sexual misconduct and not really what it is? The language is, is so critically important. And let me take a step back and tell you what we unearthed in Pennsylvania as a result of this nearly two year long grand jury investigation. Uh, we found that there were 301 predator priests who we specifically identified. And if you read our report, which is available on my website, attorneygeneral.gov, if you read the report, you'll not only find them named, you'll find their entire history, where they were, who they came in contact with, what their positions were. The grand jury found that there were thousands, thousands of child victims in Pennsylvania. Thousands. And the grand jury found that there was a systematic cover-up. When you dig into the cover-up, you learn that words really matter. Because contained in the files of these predator priests were words like horseplay that was used to describe the rape of an 11-year-old boy, inappropriate touching, words that were used to describe the rape of a young girl. The words were used that way to help foster the cover-up. And the cover-up was done in a way that not only was it contained to the church leadership in Pennsylvania, but as Lisa pointed out, it went all across the United States. Because oftentimes what they would do with these predator priests was pass them from one, quote, benevolent bishop to another. Again, words matter. And it wasn't just contained to bishops and cardinals and archbishops in the United States. The documents that we seized from the diocese show that it went all the way to the Vatican. And that these words that were used to cover it up were words that the Vatican understood as well. Inappropriate touching, horseplay, things like that. The fact is, if we're gonna really believe survivors, if we're gonna really unearth these horrors, not just in Pennsylvania and Illinois, but across the country, we gotta be honest about what it was. And if the church, under the Pope's leadership, is really serious, about the change that they claim to be serious about, and we'll find out in another couple weeks when they all meet, well then I think we all have to use the proper words to describe what really happened. We do a disservice to survivors if we don't use the language of what really occurred. Now, we don't have to be hyperbolic. In fact, I'll, I'll share with you that as we were going through the drafts of my remarks, my public remarks, when we were finally going to release this report, 
I think we wrote seven or eight different drafts, um, myself and my team. By the final draft, we had taken out, if not all, nearly every adjective in, that, uh, in those public comments. We felt that I did not need to use adjectives. We didn't need to rely on hyperbole. We didn't need to rely on uh, words that might attract attention when all we had to do was simply state the facts as they were. Not in the language that the church had used for decades, but in the language of what these actions really were. It was a systematic cover-up. It was a systematic cover-up of the raping of young children. Uh, and it was a church turning itself, turning its back on the very people that they were supposed to support and represent and care for. Words really, really matter. And we want to be very, very careful about uh, the words we use, and we want to make sure that they are used properly. The final thing I'll say is this. Every single word that we chose to define what really happened came as a result of the secret archives that were taken from the diocese. That's their own personnel records, their own, their own documents, half a million pages of them, and the witness testimony at the grand jury. And so we thought it was important to honor the survivors and to tell what really happened by relying on actual words of what occurred, not the glossary of terms that the church relied on for so long. General Madigan, I wanted to see if you would weigh in on that as well. Josh did a wonderful job in describing the importance of honoring and supporting survivors. I mean, to me, that is what is so unbelievable in this circumstance. Um, the behavior that took place is clearly criminal behavior. And there was, as we saw, even just in an initial investigation, um, not just a cover-up, but even a failure to investigate. So any excuse that the church had or concocted not to investigate, they took it. So they almost never would investigate if it was just the first time somebody had complained about a member of the clergy. They wouldn't investigate if the church um, had moved the priest, the priest had resigned, uh, the priest was dead. Um, they wouldn't investigate if the survivor wanted to remain anonymous. So uh, what is unbelievable to me is that there was just a disinterest or an unwillingness to even find out the extent to which these crimes were taking place, which is one of the reasons that I've long said, look, the Catholic Church clearly can't police itself. Right. And that's why people like Josh, myself, others attorneys general, other law enforcement, are going to have to come in and do these investigations. And again, it's really difficult and horrible work. I am sure that the attorneys and the paralegals and the staff in the Pennsylvania Attorney General's office experience the same things that the lawyers and staff and paralegals in my office have experienced. It's traumatic yeah. because, you know, as Josh just described, horseplay is rape. And we are talking about the physical violation of sometimes incredibly young children. Mm -hmm. And another thing that we should talk more about is, you know, the church's response to this so often has been, well, that stuff is old. It happened in the past. Um, for the survivors, for people who lived through this, um, many of them are still alive. You know, if you say, well, this was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, well, those people are 30. They're 40, they're 50, they're 60. They're alive. They've had to live with this trauma every single day. And the impact it has had on them is terrible. So uh, there's so much to discuss here. It, it's so difficult, um, but it's so important for their survivors. It's so important for all of us to have a full accounting of what took place and to hold these people accountable for it. Well, obviously, your report created national, international headlines, and um, it, it started to become known as the Summer of Shame uh, for the Catholic Church. Between the Pennsylvania report, uh, Cardinal McCarrick being removed as cardinal, even though he was retired. Um, however, now it is interesting, in the last few weeks, there has been some criticism. There are those speaking up and saying that your report introduction Priests were raping little boys and girls, and the men of God who were responsible for them not only did nothing, they hid it all. Mm -hmm. 
a former religion reporter for the New York Times, Peter uh, Stefanels, has recently written a report. And he is critical of this introduction, of this summary, because his point is not all victims um, were brushed aside and takes you to task quite strongly in his recent article in Commonweal. So is your summary, was it, was it too sensational? Not at all. I, I haven't read that, that person's report, but here's what we know as a matter of fact. There were thousands of children who were raped and abused by at least 301 predator priests, and the bishops and the archbishop and two cardinals in Pennsylvania covered it up, covered it up. And when the news got to the Vatican, there was no one coming from the Vatican to say, hey, cut it out in Pennsylvania. Go to law enforcement. Stop this from happening. And so what happens is, over decades, the abuse continued. And the survivors were shamed. And they were silenced. And if you read our report, I don't know if this gentleman did who, who wrote it, but if you read the report, you will see example after example, not only of the horrific abuse, but of the cover-up. The report speaks for itself and is based on the church's own secret archives. I hope everybody understands this. This is a really critical point. So here's what would happen. A priest would rape a young child. And when a report came to the bishop, who's in charge of the diocese, they would write all that information down. Oftentimes, they would share that information with the Vatican. They would then seal that document up in what's known as a secret archive. Their words, not mine. And then that priest typically would show up on Sunday and lie to parishioners. They would lie to the media when the media would inquire. And oftentimes, they would either not go to law enforcement or, and we should talk about this more today, law enforcement would have their back. There's a section within our report where law enforcement turned a blind eye. And in fact, one example of a district attorney specifically shutting down an investigation because he wanted the support of the church in an upcoming election. And he didn't want to cause any embarrassment to the church. Again, not Josh Shapiro's words. Those are the words of the testimony of that former DA to our grand jury based on the documents seized in the secret archives. So I recognize that what we unearthed in Pennsylvania is shocking to some, it's upsetting to some, and I've been you know, subject to a lot of personal attacks as a result of it. I'm a big boy, I can handle it. But the report speaks for itself, and it is based not on Josh Shapiro's feelings, but it is based on the church's secret archives, facts, and evidence, and we applied the law. Understand that as we tried to apply the law, we could only charge two of those 301 predator priests. Now, some have passed away, but of those living, we could only charge two of the 301. Why? Because the systematic cover-up mm -hmm. was done not just to spare embarrassment to the church <clears throat> or bad press to the church or financial challenges to the church, but they knew the statute of limitations had a limit. And so they would push this off as long as they could to get outside the statute of limitations. They'd pass these predator priests from one benevolent bishop to another to escape the statute of limitations. It was not only systematic in terms of shutting down the, the, the survivors, but it was systematic in terms of eluding law enforcement time and time again. They had a reason for doing what they did and they carried it out. It is documented in our report. And if some people disagree with it, they're entitled to express their opinion. But we stand by our report, and we're very proud of the work done by the 23 grand jurors uh, and, and the team in my office. So are there any substantiated claims of people who are in active ministry today? Uh, sure. I mean, there's an entire section uh, involving now Cardinal Whirl, when he was Bishop Whirl in Pittsburgh. My understanding is he's still leading uh, the Archdiocese in Washington, D.C., uh, Bishop Zubik uh, of Pittsburgh uh, today uh, was the right-hand man to Cardinal Whirl. He got elevated uh, after his participation in the cover-up. Uh, we have another bishop in Allentown uh, who is involved at a lower level. If you look at the church's leadership today in Pennsylvania, I can only speak to our commonwealth, there are people in positions of leadership today who are documented in our report as having been involved in the cover-up.
And so under, understand this, right? Understand what he's saying. And this, is, this won't come as a surprise to anyone, I don't think. Because all of this is documented when it comes in and it's put in files, look, if you're the bishop, you know this is going on. If you're the chancellor, you know this is going on. And so you know the people that might have held a lower position 10, 20, 30 years ago, they're the people who've had to handle these so-called problems when they come in. And they're also the same people, the same group of people who are being elevated. But understand as well, the Catholic Church, like many institutions, it's very insular. Everybody knows what's going on. The idea that you know, nobody knew, nobody knew that there were, you know, this many priests or what the clergy were doing. Um, that's just not accurate. Everybody knew what was going on. There was a clear, you know, MO in terms of how they wanted to handle the situation. And so, as you heard, you know, from the priest level all the way up to the Vatican, it's documented and it's known. And the real question is, are they going to be held accountable? You know, are they going to come clean and tell parishioners, tell the public, tell law enforcement what happened? And are we going to have the ability to actually hold them criminally accountable for what occurred? There are those, however, that also know that sexual abuse of minors is a huge epidemic and touches every major institute. So why so much emphasis on the Catholic Church? Sure. Well, let, let's talk about institutions and let's talk about, um, you know, people who abuse children. Uh, just a couple <laughs> months ago, we arrested a doctor in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, West, southwestern Pennsylvania, who had abused uh, dozens of his young patients. Uh, we have a, a, an investigation going on right now into a jail in northeastern Pennsylvania. In that case, it's uh, adult women, but prison guards uh, sexually assaulting women within their care. We have an example in Pennsylvania where you have Penn State University and three powerful administrators, two vice presidents, I think were their titles, and the president, uh, we convicted for covering up the crimes of Jerry Sandusky. So I I've made it very clear, we're gonna go after child predators um, no matter who they are. And the important fact is here, no institution should be off limits. For too long in this country, we have allowed institutions, be it faith institutions, universities, Hollywood, politics, to be off limits from criticism, off limits from the reach of law enforcement. And I firmly believe there is a reckoning going on in this country right now where we will not let powerful institutions get away with being so insular anymore, right? Whether it's the Me Too movement, whether it's the Cosby case, whether it's the work we did on the Catholic Church or Penn State or whatever the case may be, there's a real reckoning going on in this country, and we are better for it as a country if we are holding these powerful institutions accountable for their role in thinking just about their reputations and not about the people that they are there to serve. And I think we all have a collective responsibility to speak up when we see these things going on, call it out, empower law enforcement to go after it, and hold people accountable, whether it's a faith institution or a university, or anything else. That's what we do in the Pennsylvania Attorney General's Office. That's what Lisa Madigan did uh, in her time as Attorney General in Illinois, and that's what we need more in law enforcement and more in government to do. This is about whether we're gonna put people before powerful institutions. We do that in Pennsylvania. I think we need to do that all across this country. And but to follow up, you know, you look and you see when have these issues actually been addressed? Well, they've been addressed when the Boston Globe, you know, digs into all of this and finds out what's going on. And then the public, parishioners and the public are mm -hmm. outraged. Mm -hmm. You do it when the Pennsylvania grand jury report comes out and you realize, well, it can't only be Pennsylvania. This was systematic throughout mm -hmm. the country. Um, and so there is a great need for all of us, as Josh just said, to demand change, and whether that be in the Catholic Church or the work that I've been very proud to be able to do in terms of campus sexual assault right. here in Illinois. And we were able, as you'll recall, we were able to unfortunately deal with the aftermath of Speaker Denny Hastert's 
uh, you know, sexual assault of minors uh, by actually changing the law here in Illinois to eliminate the criminal statute of limitations for child sexual abuse and assault. Mm -hmm. So when these opportunities come up because of these horrible circumstances, we have to demand change. And that's just, that's part of it. And it's not just that the Catholic Church doesn't want bad press. They don't want the financial liability that comes with it. And that's another reason that they have not disclosed these things over the years and willingly. So there's so much, I mean, it's so complicated, but in some ways it shouldn't be complicated at all, and certainly for the church. I mean, you can't hold yourself out as the ultimate moral authority and be raping and molesting children. Yeah, good point, good point. You know, back in 1991, when I did this article, uh, first stories, very innocently met with some friends of mine, former priests. They had left to get married. And so I met with them and said, I want to do a story about you. You know, you, you, you're still, they're all involved in social service agencies doing similar kinds of work and, and helping people in communities. And they said, we're not the story. The story is that priests are abusing children and being moved from prayer. And I sat there at lunch, like, what are you talking? You know, I, I couldn't even fathom what they were talking about. And those stories, you know, I wa I've watched them recently again, and I said, wow, you know, it's I can't even imagine that we did it then. And as a matter of fact, the parish priest where I grew up stood up at Mass that Sunday. There are lies being told right. at NBC this week, right. you know, lies being told. But anyway. Um, you know, people were appalled. But, you know, General Matt, you know that in the Catholic Church here in Chicago, it has been so vital on so many social issues and played such a role in the fabric of, of Chicago. Is this crisis, it has shaken so many. Can the church regain its footing? I think in order for the church, whether it's in Chicago or anywhere in the world at this point, to regain its footing, they have to publicly disclose what happened, because they have failed to do that at this point. And it is so clear to people that they have covered this up for so many years. And there are so many survivors and their families and their friends who have had to deal with the repercussions of these crimes and the trauma that until there is a complete and full accounting I don't think they'll be able to regain their footing. There is a real lack of trust uh, in terms of the Catholic Church hierarchy. And so that's one of the main reasons that we wanted to make sure that survivors had an opportunity. You know, we put in place, and I'm sure other states have done this as well, I know Pennsylvania did something similar, we put in place a hotline so that people could call. Uh, people could also email the Attorney General's office. Uh, at the time I left over a month ago, there were over 300 people who'd contacted the office with stories uh, of what happened to them. And many of them decades old, many of them they had never disclosed uh, because they had seen what had happened to other people. And so, you know, the church really needs to not just speak the words, because they're good at words, right? But they have to actually take the actions that they have failed to for so many years when it comes to prioritizing and supporting survivors and being transparent. And so, you know, I think we're all very anxious to see what happens at the end of February when the bishops get together to have a discussion about this and hopefully put in place some protocols and some real changes with some teeth. But at this point, what I can tell you, they appear to be, throughout the state of Illinois at least, handling these cases much in the same manner uh, as they have for the past decades. Ah. And that Vatican Abuse Summit coming up in three weeks, as you mentioned. So one person from all over the world coming to uh, Rome with Cardinal Supage as one of the four organizers of this meeting. Um, they're already trying to downplay a little bit of the expectations. <laughs> Last week, Pope Francis trying to say, oh, wait a second, you know, uh, you know, we've got a lot to work on here. But do you think, either of you, um, because of your investigations, that now the role that law enforcement is playing in this, um, of course they had in, in 2002 the Dallas Charter telling priests zero tolerance. Imagine that. You had to write that down. You had to say in writing, zero tolerance. And now they need to write it down to tell the bishops 
you cannot move people and not tell folks what's going on. You must report this. But they sort of, you know, bringing everyone together to unify this response. Might this role of, that law enforcement has played really force them now to be more accountable for these actions? I don't know what's going to happen at this meeting. I was heartened by the fact that just, I think, two or three days after our report was released, the Pope himself, in, in public comments, acknowledged what was in our report, didn't question the facts, uh, didn't push back on it, acknowledged the pain, acknowledged the horrors, uh, and then shortly thereafter called this meeting for February where he promised real serious action. I'm paraphrasing his words, of course. So I'm, I'm hopeful. I think I'm more hopeful today that there is an opportunity as opposed to maybe after the Globe report, which was extraordinary, and I, I've told the Globe reporters that themselves. Uh, it, because the church now knows everything it needs to know to make serious, concrete change. And what do I mean by that? They've seen enough news articles. They've seen the patterns and practices in our report <coughs> that are not dissimilar to the patterns and practices from Lisa Madigan's report that, by the way, will not be that dissimilar to the reports that will inevitably come from the 14 state attorneys general who are investigating right now and the feds who are doing what they're doing right now. You're going to see the same patterns and practices over and over again. They understand uh, that through their own secret archives, if they take time to read it, that they had a glossary of terms that was used to cover it up. They understand that they systematically pushed past the statute of limitations. They understand that there was a system of benevolent bishops. They understand all of these things if they take the time to read these reports. And so, understanding all that now, you would think that an organization whose charge it is to care for people would put systems in place to protect the most vulnerable among us, our children. All that being said, I have said many times, and Lisa said this earlier, and I think she is spot on, the church cannot be trusted to police itself. The church cannot be trusted to police itself. So I hope that whatever comes out of this meeting in February includes some sort of secular recognition that secular authorities must be part of the solution. And so if they take the time to read our report, as the Pope has already acknowledged the work, if they take the time to understand these patterns and practices here in the United States and presumably across the globe, if they acknowledge the fact that they can't do it themselves and invite some type of secular authority to be a part of that, then hopefully some real change can come. They have all the facts. They have all the information. The, pre, the, the Pope has said that he has the will. Uh, now they have to go and prove it. And I would say, Based on the work that we were able to do here in Illinois on campus sexual assault, there is a way to make that realization happen, that you have to treat people like humans. And I know that sounds insane to say about the Catholic Church and about the clergy, but when we were looking at addressing the problem of campus sexual assault, the first thing we did was to do three summits in Illinois, one up here in Chicago, one down in Cham uh, Champaign-Urbana, and then we did one down in um, southern Illinois. And we opened every one of them with a survivor. And she came in and she spoke, woman from out of state, so there wasn't that complication. And it was so powerful to listen to what she had endured, not just in terms of the actual sexual assault, but what was the response from the leadership of the university, which was dreadful, right? They basically told her they can't do anything. They'd have to wait for the rape kit to come back. She couldn't you know, change classes. There were all kinds of problems. I would strongly urge the Catholic Church and the leadership of the Catholic Church specifically to have to sit and listen to survivor after survivor talk about what they endured at the hands of one of their own mm -hmm. and how that has impacted their lives. Josh Stein, Josh Stein, Josh Shapiro has a phenomenal video. Now, is that up on your website? It is. Yeah. So get on his website. There is a video compilation of, I think it's at least three survivors, yeah. and they are 
talking about what they've endured. And it, I mean, even right now, it chokes me up to think about. You know, you spend any amount of time with survivors and you realize just the terrible, lifelong impact this has. It ruins people's lives. They have ruined people's lives. They need to hear that, understand that, and respond like humans. Not like we are, you know, the front people, the defense people for this institution, this corporate institution that's the Catholic Church. They are there to minister to people, and that's how it has to be handled appropriately. That is, that is so important, and, and I hope that you will take the time to learn about the survivors in Pennsylvania. I want to just tell you quickly uh, about a few of them, because as Lisa said, you know, the abuse happens when they're very young. They carry that with them the rest of their lives, and it has a lifetime impact on them. Uh, one of the gentlemen I was honored to meet, his name is Bob. He's 83 years old. Uh, he was raped when he was about 13 years old. Bob was married to the same woman for almost 60 years. She, they have adult children. She passed away not too long ago. Bob went and saw Spotlight uh, in a local town theater when he was in his late 70s. He had never told anyone about his abuse, never told his wife of nearly 60 years, never told his children. He sees Spotlight. At the end of the movie, he stands up and announces to the entire theater that he had been abused. I'm getting, I'm, I'm going wow. to cry a little bit when I think about Bob, but he carried that around with him his entire life. And Bob, I sat in his backyard in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and he told me about how he could never hug his son. He could never hug his son. He was afraid to touch his own child. Bob's one of the lucky ones. Mm -hmm. The number of moms and dads I met, Corey's mom and dad in Pennsylvania, Corey took his own life because he couldn't deal with the pain, the literal pain he felt from having his back crushed while being raped by a priest when he was a young boy he got addicted to opioids to deal with the pain and ultimately died uh, of an overdose carolyn who was 18 months old wearing diapers when she was first abused by her priest and the story she talks about not being able to grow up in a way where where she could have the kind of experiences that, that we have understand these survivors carry with them a lifetime of impact. The church didn't just, the church wasn't just complicit in raping and abusing these children. The church oversaw a, a lifetime of negative consequences and not only didn't help them, we have examples in our report where the church actually went negative, if you mm -hmm. will, on the survivors. It's horrifying. And we have this moment in time where the church not only needs to acknowledge the abuse and put systems in place to make sure something like this doesn't happen again, but to also respect survivors. And what you find is that as a result of our report of Lisa's work and others, more and more survivors, not just of clergy abuse, are finally having the courage to speak up. We've gotten almost 1,500 calls to our clergy abuse hotline since August. When you put a report on TV like, like you have done in the past, you are helping survivors have the courage to speak up because they think maybe someone's going to believe me. Mm -hmm. Whether it's at a university, whether it's in a church, whether it's in politics, Hollywood, wherever, survivors need to be trusted. And we all have a responsibility in this room to reduce the stigma associated with you know, survivors coming forward and respect them and listen to them and believe them when they come forward. That will make our society stronger if we're able to do that. Oh, we have so many more questions, but we'd like to hear from some of you here today that also have questions. We'd like a couple of the students in the back, please, you, if you could start. Uh, my name is Lish Valley. I'm a PhD candidate here in religious ethics at the Divinity School. Um, first of all, thank you for your work. Um, just oh, Thank you, Michael Lish Valley. Um, thank you for your work uh, precisely because I do think that um, so often survivors are only coming out after things like Spotlight happen, after um, your reporting. Um, and I think that also illustrates some of the challenges uh, facing with this, that you know, people um, who have been abused maybe 20, 30, 60 years ago are only coming out with comfort to report this in the last mm -hmm. 10 um, or 15 years, um, which I think presents a challenge and, and some sort of a problem that I'm hearing today, which is both a collapse of time, of the time scale, and a collapse of some of the problems, the, the sort of crimes that we're hearing about. Um, so for example, when the moderator asked whether there are accused priests 
who are still in active ministry today, I was hearing the question, are there accused predators? And not just accused um, people who are, who are sort of accused of cover-ups. Um, and both of those are, are crimes, um, but different crimes. Um, and so it raises for me the question that I think that a lot of Catholics would have today, which is, is the church a safe place for their kids today? Is there a difference pre and post 2002 when the Dallas Charter was issued? Um, or maybe a, a, just a question to raise to the attorney generals from your position as, um, as lawyers evaluating things like the Dallas Charter. Um, does it do sufficient work to protect children while recognizing that there's this larger issue of becoming more public um, about the actual crimes that have historically taken place? Thank you very much. So I would start by saying uh, the 2002 charter um, was an okay start, um, but there are some significant deficiencies in it that still have yet to be addressed in terms of holding bishops accountable in particular. Um, the church argues, and I won't disagree with them, that since 2002 things have gotten better moving forward in terms of the policies and the processes that they have put in place to attempt to make sure that they are not bringing people into the clergy uh, who may decide to um, perpetrate these crimes and to make sure that uh, lay people who are working for the church, uh, they're doing background checks and training and things of that nature. So they have better policies and processes. Are they perfect? They are absolutely not perfect. Um, and Another significant deficiency with the charter is that there is no uniform set of standards when it comes to investigations, when it comes to reporting to law enforcement, when it comes to standard of proof for determining whether or not an accusation is ever deemed a credible accusation or a substantiated accusation. So there is a lot more that needs to be done which is why I would hope that some of this is addressed later in February, although it's also in some ways absurd that it hasn't been addressed up to this point because these are well-known deficiencies and you know, frequently commented on deficiencies over the years. So moving forward, have things gotten better? Yes. Uh, they have failed, as we've talked about extensively today, to account for the past, uh, but there is still a lot more work that needs to be done. And, you know, the bishops, just to reiterate the point, they answer to Rome. That's who they answer to. So that is why this needs to be done in February. You know, they, don't, um, they don't answer to, you know, the, the Cardinal of Chicago. Each one answers to Rome. So that is why more uniform policy does really need to be in place. Yeah. Yes, please. Right. Oh, the microphone's going to my name is Grace Quigley, and I'm a fourth year in the college. Um, and I wanted to ask about, um, this kind of was brought on by your surprise in the 90s when you learned of this from your friends who had been priests. Um, I was in middle school when this came out about Irish priests assaulting children. Um, and so for my lifetime, this would not have come as a surprise. And so I wonder why there was, um, I'm not sure if there was, shock about the failure or there was some expectation in the last decades or so of self-policing within the church. Why was that? Um, especially given that we've seen this in other countries and it doesn't really come as a surprise if you're someone who's my age. Thank you. I think is it, well, we've talked a little bit about this here today, that as this information was coming out, I guess more, more throughout your lifetime, so maybe it wasn't as much of a surprise, what hadn't changed, and I think is beginning to change now, certainly in recent years, is the, the premium people placed on the institution over people, right? Making sure that the institution was sound and whole and protected was the top priority, not protecting this poor child who had just been abused. And so I think that that, you know, while some of the facts may have been out, I think that balance is, is being tilted. I think in part because of our work, in part because of other things that are happening uh, across this country. That's a good thing. And it will happen even more when students like you and others continue to speak up, uh, demand this reckoning, and demand that people be placed before powerful institutions. And I think we have to continue to evolve 
uh, as, as a community, as, as a commonwealth, as a country, and, and, and we will be better for it. Coupled with that, as we've talked about here today, the church, universities, as, as you talked about with your good work on, on campus sexual assault and campus safety issues, need to step up and, and do more to protect the people uh, in its care, not just its reputation. And I firmly believe that as a society, uh, through our political discourse, if we begin placing a value, a, a premium on, you know, universities, institutions, church, whatever, standing up and saying, we have a problem, we're acknowledging it, we're standing with survivors and we're doing something about it, and that becomes the positive message, as opposed to hiding that, instead trying to prop up your institution, I think we'll be better off as a result of that. Uh, and I think folks like you, Grace, are going to have to be leaders in that effort. Um, some of it will come from law enforcement, um, a lot of it will come from the media, but it really is going to have to come from students and young people and voters like you. There were times when they would do, we would do stories that, um, you know, and even to this day, the Archdiocese recently, this, this past summer, a story that I had done interviewing uh, Cardinal Supich, and in the midst of the story, it was a much longer answer, but part of his answer was, I'm not going down that rabbit hole. Well, you can imagine that, you know, that definitely made my story at five, at six, at 10. You know, I mean, I heard it. I was trying to be polite and listening, but I'm thinking to myself, that's odd. Um, you know, and, and it was more about, there was, you know, all of the inside, um, this Cardinal Vigano, Archbishop Vigano, who had accused, there was a, there was a lot more to it. So he, the context, it was not just about abuse, but his, his overall, there's more on the Pope's agenda you know, we're not going to just go down Vigano's rabbit hole, you know, blah, blah, blah. So he was so, it, it took 48 hours from the story airing that then, of course, the bloggers and social media just really went kind of crazy. That 48 hours later, the Archdiocese put out a statement that he was inaccurately report that there was misreporting. Yeah. And yeah. that um, it was unfair and misreported. Never called me. I mean, it's certainly, I've had people call. I'm not even sure if uh, Attorney General Lee's Probably me. Call me. I'm <laughs> sure. I mean, people definitely call and say, you know, hey, wait a minute. You know, I said much more than that. Or, you know, that's not fair the way. No one said a word to me for 48 hours, but because it got all over the, you know, all over the internet. Um, not only did he do that, they took it even a little bit further and ordered all of the priests in the Chicago Archdiocese to read a letter mm -hmm. at Mass that Sunday that there was misreporting, oh. and it was not true. I did not hand him a script. I did not. I mean, this is what he said. You know, it was really odd. And that I was now, you know, it was, it was we were the problem. The messenger. Always it's the messenger is the problem, not the message. So, you know, I, I'm glad to hear you say that you're not appalled. I mean, that, that it wasn't surprised because you've realized this, mm -hmm. and that's the change. That is a good thing. But for us, much older than you, it was shocking. It was at, because, of course, we trusted, you know, the church and the priest. The parents went to the bishop rather than the police. They went right. to talk to the, they went to the pastor and said, oh, my goodness, Look what happened to my son. Or they didn't even believe their own children. Of course. We had a, example after example in our report where the children would be abused. They would then come home and tell their parents, and their parents wouldn't believe them. Wouldn't believe we them. had some cases where the parents actually harmed their children for speaking ill of, you know, of God, really. Right. Uh, and it, it's heartbreaking. And obviously now um, people are, are more prone to believe. But... You know, we have a lot of work to do to keep that going. And, Any other but, look, I just want to follow up for yeah. two seconds. Yeah. I mean, understand, just based on what Mary Ann described to you in that interview, the reality is the church still doesn't want to deal with this. They perpetually are saying that was years ago, that was the past. But for, I mean, all of us sitting here, most of us sitting here, I presume, recognize for the survivors, it is every day. It is every day of their lives. It is not in the past, it is now. It is something they still have to endure. Mm -hmm. And so now that there are a generation of people who question authority and have you know, the ability to do so, that's why we're seeing things change. And I'll just add two seconds. I think Lisa's right. The bishops 
are, are very uncomfortable with the idea of change and doing something about it, you know who does want to do something about it? Parishioners. Mm -hmm. And I Absolutely. hear that anecdotally wherever I go across the country, they stop me. And I mean, I didn't know if parishioners were, were going to, you know, sort of attack me afterwards and be upset with what we did. Uh, in fact, it's been the exact opposite. They have said thank you and they want change. Uh, within the church, and I think they're going to demand it. Right. I, I'd like to get one other student, make sure we get all the students in. Is there a student back here? Yeah, one more back here. Yes, Kathy. Great, thank you. We'll get, we'll get to you, too. Um, hi, I'm Mallory Moore. I'm a first year in the college. Um, earlier, you kind of have touched on, like, the importance of working with law enforcement, but you also kind of mentioned, like, the challenges, such as a justice up for re-election, mm -hmm. um, not being, like, willing to engage. Can you, like, kind of talk more about how you address that issue like within your departments? Yeah, we put people before powerful institutions and we don't think about the politics when we're making a decision. I mean, I'm, I'm a very proud Democrat. I've got very strong views um, that align with where a lot of people are in the Democratic Party. I make no apologies for that and where appropriate, I speak out very strongly about that protecting women's right to choose, standing up for our LGBTQ community, standing up uh, to President Trump's constant violation of the rule of law. These are things I'm proud of. But when I do my job as the Attorney General, I do believe that the decisions we have to make have to be above politics. You know, it, I don't lose my the, the views that I hold dear, but I have to make decisions based simply on the facts and the evidence and apply the law. And when you begin to make decisions where you allow politics or relationships to creep into those decisions, you are bound to make bad decisions. And you are bound to do things that are unjust or things that are you know, unethical or in some cases unlawful. And so I think what you have to do as an attorney general, Lisa did it a lot longer and a lot better than, than I've done it. And I wanna hear her answer on this is, you just have to hold your personal views very, very, very close and, and not be ashamed of them and not be afraid to speak out about them, but they can't interfere with the facts and the evidence in your application of the law. I'll just share a quick personal story with you, um, and I, I don't talk about this a lot, but um, you know, this investigation's going on for nearly two years. Um, my wife, who I've been with since the ninth grade, I mean, I tell her everything. <laughs> I don't tell her at all about this because it's a grand jury investigation. I mean, it's against the law to share this kind of information with anyone, even, even your spouse. But the night before we were gonna release this, I kind of gave her a general sense of what was to come. And I said, listen, you know, 25% of our state electorate is Catholic. Uh, they may end up, you know, really hating what I did here and thinking that this was wrong or an attack on the church and, and things that of course it was not, but they may feel that way. And this could be sort of the end of my political road. Uh, but I believe so strongly in telling the survivors stories, in unearthing the cover up and, and the horrors that went on here in Pennsylvania, that I'm willing to accept whatever political consequences come. And I think when you are a prosecutor, when you're an attorney general, you have to have that attitude about every case. You gotta focus on the facts and the evidence and apply the law and not worry about what the impact is gonna to be to your politics uh, or to your standing in the community. And obviously the reaction here has been positive and the opposite, but you know, we did this regardless of what the reaction was gonna be politically. So I would follow on by saying, I'm a woman, I'm a mother, and I'm a Catholic. And many of the lawyers in my office who are part of this investigation, they're Catholic as well. We didn't demand that anybody be part of the team. We had people come to us internally in the office and say they wanted to be part of this. And it's been very, very difficult for them, but there is a firm commitment uh, that we had to, as Josh said, and this is always how I've described it, uh, with every circumstance that you're presented with in the Attorney General's office, you look at the facts and you look at the law and you do what's right. It's right. just that simple. And what has taken place in the Catholic Church is wrong. It's morally wrong, it's criminally wrong, and they have to be held accountable. And so I hope that the new administration is going to continue this investigation because I think that the parishioners and the public demand it and I think it's the right thing to do. Bravo, agreed. And were there other questions? One back here, and I'll come back to you. Yay. 
I'm glad I don't have to call on people. That's, <laughs> that's the hardest Hi, job. Hi, I'm Isha. I'm a first year MPP here. My question to you is, uh, do you think church has been the moral authority for so long that they would be open to outside monitoring? And I say that because uh, we have a consent degree that's going on with the law enforcement here. I'm trying to draw a parallel in the sense that will there ever be outside monitoring that will help us, you know, so that we don't have to worry that they are struggling with policing themselves and we still have consequences to deal with. So do you think they I'll give you a, a 20 second answer. I, I've said it before, the church cannot police itself and they cannot be successful at rooting out the predator priests, at ending the culture of, of cover up uh, and corruption unless they have outside forces, secular leadership, law enforcement involved in whatever process uh, they come up with. Yeah, there has to be something because as we've talked about over and over again, it's year after year, it's crime after crime. I mean, it's, you know, it's not a couple of bad eggs. It didn't happen a couple of times. Mm -hmm. It happened hundreds, thousands of times and almost every single time they failed to react properly. They haven't put in place the policies. They haven't put in place uniform procedures. They haven't admitted what has happened. And so they can't police themselves. There's going to have to be something, uh, whether that comes from the government uh, or they are actually able to fashion something, you know, as they tried, you know, with some various groups of you know, lay individuals to do. Uh, but it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when and how. There was a question over here. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm a local resident. Um, do you think it's possible that either a private citizen, a state attorney general, or the U.S. attorney general in the future could go to the International Court in The Hague and go after the Vatican on this? And, you know, it actually, uh, Barbara Blaine, a former mm -hmm. the gal who ran Survivor's Network of Those Abused by Priests, God bless Barbara Blaine, you know, passed away unexpectedly a year ago, had done that. She did go and, and uh, spoke to The Hague uh, about the Vatican. Um, I don't, re I can't I don't give you the ac accurate answer on that other than to say, obviously, I don't think it went all the way, uh, any consequences, but she did try that angle. And I do believe there, you know, the Vatican having special rules, whatever the Vatican state, but it has been attempted. Might it be again? I don't know. But How about at the UN? I don't know that one. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know the, the treaties or the laws, yeah. but it's yeah. a... It's a creative and reasonable idea. Right, right. Yes, sir. I have a really short question. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tom. I live in the suburbs. Any event, uh, quick question. I had teaching credentials in several states. In at least some states, teachers had an affirmative obligation to report any suspected child abuse, not just among the staff, but among at home. And it wasn't like you knew about it. You suspected it. Does a similar obligation occur in the Catholic Church to priests, to teachers, et cetera? Tom, the grand jury um, had really two goals that they spelled out. One was to unearth the facts, and two is to ensure that something like this never can happen again in Pennsylvania. And one of the reforms that they recommended, they recommended four specific reforms, but one of those reforms was to clarify who mandated reporters are and to put an added burden on them to report and added penalties if, if they don't report. Uh, we're working to get those reforms passed in our state legislature right now. And so here in Illinois, uh, teachers are mandated reporters. In fact, I just had to sign something to be, I'm now a mandated reporter too. Uh, and clergy are mandated reporters. I don't remember the history. I know I looked into it when I was still the attorney general in terms of the timing because it changes over time. Uh, but yes, they are mandated reporters. Are there others? I thought you had a question. Um, for Lisa, um, I, have a, Lisa, I have a friend, Wiley University, just graduated there, but she pointed out to me Microphone. about, um, I believe it's called Title X. It's um, basically if a rape happens on campus, there's Title IX. Title IX. Okay. So um, I think it was this update. Why are um, not the victims, but the perpetrators? getting more breaks as far as? 
Well, that, that's, uh, that's all Betsy DeVos. I hear people, <laughs> it's President Trump and Betsy DeVos, and that's a political conversation that I would be so happy to have with you and all of you. Uh, but here's what I'm going to tell you. The, the, here's the good thing. Because of the work that we were able to do here in Illinois several years ago, back in 2015, uh, we have at every college and university uh, requirements that are now substantially better than what the federal government well, uh, has. recently updated because she Yes, she has. She, here, yes is the answer. And, she and did change those. Um, the guidance. The rapists are getting more breaks or more freedom during the investigation of a rape on campus. It, yeah, I can, that is one way to interpret it. Yes, really I can sense. speak to that real quickly. Uh, Betsy DeVos did sort of change the dynamics um, in sort of tilting the scales away from survivors and instead toward those uh, who, who commit the assault. I'm I'm leading uh, 21 states in opposition to Betsy DeVos's new rules, and so we're fighting back on that right now. I think we should uh, kind of try to come to a conclusion, and, and maybe both of you have just a statement or two to give us. Where does it go from here? Obviously, we wait for Rome, but what about law enforcement? Might we see uh, criminal charges? Uh, might we see some of the bishops who have ignored what's happened? Might, I, I've heard of even RICO. I mean, where, where does it go from here? So you'll ask that question to Attorney General Raul. And, uh, but to the best of my knowledge, uh, the Illinois investigation continues. We only started our investigation really the beginning of September. I think I reached out right before Labor Day to the bishops and to Cardinal Supich here in Chicago. So there is an enormous amount of work that remains. And also understand that in terms of the information that we were able to unearth uh, and that they handed over to us, that was all done voluntarily up to this point. And so there may come a time where we do need to look at criminal subpoenas, grand juries, uh, in terms of getting all of the information. And so it will depend on what the response is of the diocese here in Illinois, what the response is from the Vatican. Uh, but I think as people have demonstrated here today, there is not just a need, but a demand for change and a demand for accounting and accountability and that parishioners and the public and law enforcement are no longer going to simply allow the Catholic Church to deal with these crimes as personnel matters. Um, these are criminal actions that have lifelong repercussions on the survivors and their families and something is going to have to change and it's gonna change soon. Thank you very much, General Shapiro. When, when we showed what we showed in our report based on the church's secret archives and the direct witness testimony in the grand jury, um, we showed example after example where the church uh, leaders and the predator priests weaponized their faith and used it as a tool of abuse against um, children, against the parishioners, against the church, against the, uh, the community. And in every single instant of the living 301 predator priests and those who enabled the cover-up, we ran each of them through what's called a statute of limitations test to see who we could charge directly with abuse and who we could charge with the cover-up. Sadly, because of our relatively weak laws in Pennsylvania, of all of those individuals named in the report, we could only charge two predator priests. And both of them were just sentenced to pretty stiff sentences uh, in, in prison where they belong. We need to change our laws in Pennsylvania and across the country. We need to continue uh, to foster this reckoning that is going on uh, all across the United States as a result of this work and, and others. It's important that we're here at the Institute of Politics and we're honored David Axelrod is with us. There is a political aspect to this and I don't mean Democrat or Republican, I mean making this relevant in elections, making this relevant in our civil discourse. You know, are we gonna place a premium on institutions or on people? And I think that the more we can challenge people who are running for office, the more we can challenge occupants of these offices to say, who do you stand with? How do we tilt the balance back in favor of people who have been harmed? I think that's healthy for our politics. It's healthy uh, for our democracy. It's healthy for our republic, and we need to do more of that. Uh, and I, I mean, I can't think of a better place to bring that message into the Institute of Politics here. I mean, this, this is an extraordinary place 
with, I mean, just based on the questions from Grace and Michael and the students, a lot of big brains here, y'all have the power uh, to make this change in our civil discourse, and we need you to do that. Uh, the church will do what it's going to do. Law enforcement is going to do what it's going to do. But the most powerful tool here are your voices and your ability to effectuate change. And uh, you have a, a, a tremendous opportunity here, and I hope that you will seize on that and, and take advantage of this moment in time to, to continue to put people before powerful institutions. Well, we're all very lucky to have had you both here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really, you're terrific. You're terrific.